Hello, my name is Travis Newbell with Shambhala Mountain Center, and I'm glad to have Marcella Friel, uh, my friend and a teacher who comes up to SMC um, once a year and leads this wonderful retreat that um, I have not participated in myself, but here's such good, warm, deeply, uh, deeply good reviews about from my friends at SMC. Woman, Women, Food, and Forgiveness, The Heroine's Journey mm. is the name of this year's retreat, and it's happening at SMC April 19th to the 23rd, and I've got Marcella on the line today to have some conversation around the topics of the retreat. Just a short um, introduction to Marcella. She is a passionate promoter of healing foods, authentic beauty, and personal transformation. Having cooked and taught in premier meditation and healing centers across North America since 1994, including Shamala Mountain Center, Marcella now runs Tapping with Marcella, a food and body image coaching practice that uses EFT, and uh, Marcella can explain a little bit about what that is, uh, uses EFT to help health-conscious adults love and forgive themselves, their bodies, and their food. And of course, you can connect on Marcella on Facebook and on our website, Tapping with Marcella. Marcella, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us today for some conversation. Hey, Travis, how you doing? Good, and uh, by the way, happy International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day. I've been thinking about that, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a great day to be talking about these things. I think so, you know, um, you know everybody who's living and breathing on this planet. Um, I won't say everybody, because I really don't know, but most of us have to have some relationship with food. And uh, I think for you know, most people that I know or who have ever talked to this about, there's some sort of you know, complications around their relationship with food. It's not an easy, straightforward, neutral thing for most of us, at least not all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but to begin, uh, in a particular way of entering our conversation, like what inspired you in particular to explore this topic of forgiveness as it relates to you know women in particular and food? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great, great question. question. You know, you first, know first, first of all, all answer that, I want to thank you for all the great work that you do for Shambhala Mountain Center. And I just want to say it's it's such a pleasure to work with you on all the levels that we've worked together. And I just, I hope they love you and appreciate you as much as I do. So thank you for everything. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the topic of women and food and forgiveness is really interesting. So I am a, I was a natural food chef for mm, close to 20 years since 1998. And I ran the kitchen at Shambhala Mountain Center for a year, as you said. And I also taught culinary school for nine years. And now what I do is I'm a mindful eating coach for people, primarily for women, who struggle with their relationship with food. And the piece about forgiveness came when a client said, some women use razor blades, I use food. Hmm. And that was a really shocking statement for me to hear. And at the same time, I wasn't really surprised. But the impact of that statement was just so strong. Um, and here was a woman who really knew what she should be eating. Like she really knew, you know, as they say in New York, she knew from food. She knew healthy foods, right? Mm -hmm. But there were these traumas and these emotional blockages that had gotten in the way of her having the relationship with food that she wanted to have to support you know, her highest good. So that's when it really began to occur to me that you know, when we look at addiction, any addiction, right? Like in my case, I work with women with food, but the essence of healing from any addiction is about forgiveness. And I can talk a little bit more about what I mean about that, but you know, that was where it got started was when she said that statement, which really kind of 
made my hair stand on end. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be, um, I don't know, I wonder if before that or during that, if there's anything about your own journey um, with food mm. you would like to sh share with the audience, food and uh, forgiveness perhaps. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question because, <clears throat> you know, to tell you the truth, I've, a lot of my clients struggle with um, overweight, obesity, body image issues. And to be honest, Travis, you know, I've never really struggled at that level. But I have struggled with sugar addiction. And I have kind of a funny story to tell about this, which is that um, when I was younger, and I was, you know, I've been a student of uh, the Shambhala teaching since 1987 and was a student kind of in the old, the old school of when we had the Kagyu Buddhist path and we had the Shambhala path and we were doing them side by side and all that. So um, I was doing my Nundro and there's a particular practice in the Nundro sequence that's about, you know, purification. And when I started this practice, a lot of people said, oh, you might get a little sick, ha, 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 you know, because a lot of people get sick when they do this practice. Well, when I started this particular practice, this Nundra practice, I couldn't leave my house for 10 days. I was so sick. I could barely leave the bathroom for 10 days. I was really sick. And finally, I got myself to a naturopathic doctor, and I remember... You know, he did a bunch of tests and stuff. And I remember this moment he looked at me over the rim of his glasses and he said, how much sugar are you eating? And at that time I was eating like, well, you know, like a candy bar a day or, you know, it didn't seem like that much to me. But I was also working in an office. And of course we know office places have like sugar galore and <clears throat> it didn't seem like that much. But I was also um, a vegetarian at the time. And that's, you know, um, you know, it's really hard if you're a vegetarian and you eat a lot of sugar. That's a very, very hard combination on your body. So he said to me, um, you're going to have to start eating meat. And I was horrified. And, and I thought, you know, it was interesting because I thought I knew about healthy eating at that point. But clearly I didn't because... Essentially what had happened, what had made me sick was I had become pre-diabetic. So I began, this was in like the mid-1990s, and I began to study um, what it is to heal with food. Because I, I had to change, you know, I was up against the wall. I had to change my relationship. And so I went to a school called The Natural Gourmet in New York City and began to, I certified as a natural food chef there. And it was interesting because combined with Buddhist training, um, what I observed was that a lot of people knew what to eat, including you know, me by that time, but didn't know how. And like as you said in the beginning of the interview, you know, all of us to some degree struggle with our food. So that's when I began to inquire about, all right, what is it emotionally that drives us to those behaviors where we harm ourselves with substances like food? I don't know if that answered your question. That might have been kind of a, a circuitous way around it, but that's my journey in a nutshell. Yeah, well, I think that's interesting because it's, um, it's getting sort of uh, closer to the root of it, you know, and that's something that's talked about in Buddhism a lot, like okay, what is going on here? The food, um, relationship to food or um, unhelpful habits around food seem to be like symptomatic of something uh, deeper, something that's going on under the surface. Well, you know, in the Shambhala teachings, we talk about the cocoon, right? <clears throat> and, you know, my understanding of that, it's like how we form our identity how we form, you know, our cocoon, what we weave that cocoon out of is like our ideas about ourselves. I'm this person. So for me, a lot of the work around forgiveness is unraveling that cocoon. You know, I don't know if this is true for you, Travis, but what I observe, what I have found for myself and what I observe in my clients is that the hardest part of the healing process is that moment when we really have to change our 
concept of who we are. That is more terrifying than physical death. Hmm. We have to, you know, so in order to forgive, we have to let something go that even though it's painful, there's still part of us that holds on. And that's why I'm calling it the heroine's journey because that it takes courage to become essentially a transformed person. So when you're working with clients, you're getting, uh, uh, you know, you're really getting into some I don't know, nitty gritty of identity and psychology. And uh, how do you approach that with people? Does it take an ongoing um, relationship with you in particular or do the, do the practices help to loosen that? You know, maybe, maybe a combination of those, but um, you know, that seems like very, you know, intense work. It is, it's, I mean, I love it. <laughs> it's really wonderful work because I get to watch people, you know, shape shift before my eyes. But, you know, what you said about um, working over time, I think you said something about, you know, working together for a while. I think that's a really important piece. You know, that's an important piece of like the teacher student relationship, right? That as, a, as students, we allow ourselves to be known by our teacher. And I think it's also a very important thing in like a coaching client relationship that I as a coach get to know you. So I start to see your patterns. In terms of how we start to do that whole piece of you know, forgiveness and unraveling the identity, that's where EFT comes in as a really helpful tool. So <clears throat> EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques. And it's sometimes called emotional acupuncture. Mm -hmm. And what it involves is fingertip tapping at or near the ends of certain acupuncture meridians. And I don't know the acupuncture aspect of it, so I can't really speak to that. But what we do is we just tap repeatedly. As we're recollecting a stressful situation, so for example, like a common, well, for example, yesterday I was working with a client who the trauma um, that she was holding was that she was put in weight and she was sent to Weight Watchers when she was 12 years old. And it was a horrible experience for her. And that's actually where she began her binge eating. Mm -hmm. So we're using EFT, we're tapping as, we're recoll as she's recollecting that experience of being at Weight Watchers. And what we're doing as we're tapping is we're sending a little electromagnetic pulse back into the limbic system of the brain where the emotional self-regulation occurs. And we're just saying to that part of the brain, it's okay to let this go, it's okay to let this go, it's okay to let this go. So I like to think of EFT as brainwashing in the positive sense. So, you know, I get to <laughs> brainwash people. <laughs> but it's very, the results can be really dramatic. And for her, in that case, it was like, Wow, you know, so we did some tapping and then I said, all right, now tell me the story again about going to Weight Watchers. And she said, it's nothing. It, it's no more than, you know, the sneakers under my bed. Hmm. So being willing to let go at that level and having the tools and the support to do that. Um, you know, for women with food, they can really feel very hopeless because you know you try a million diets and you try a million exercise programs and I just want to say to anybody who's listening to this that um, you're not condemned it's not a death sentence like there is a way out uh, I wonder on that note if there are any uh, any stories um, that stand out to you from your experience with clients, some examples of uh, you know, people, um, you know, like you just gave one. Um, yeah. I wonder if there are any other alongside that that really uh, illustrate how, um, you know, how this, this may work. Well, there's one client that comes to mind who was um, seriously addicted to diet Pepsi. And She's about 100 pounds overweight. 
And she had the Diet Pepsi stockpiled in her garage, like cases of it. And she knew she had to give it up. But at the same time, she knew she had to let go of the Diet Pepsi. But at the same time, she was like, you know, don't take my Diet Pepsi away from me. Like it's, you know, it's all I have. So we started doing some tapping on that, some EFT, like don't take my Diet Pepsi away from me. And then once we kind of got that calmed down a little bit, I asked her, so about the, the feelings that she had about the Diet Pepsi, that emotional kind of jealousy. And I said, what, you know, what's your earliest experience of this, of this feeling, right? And we went back to when she was a little girl. She was about six years old. And she went through a very, very intensely abusive childhood, not surprising. And she tried to run away from home when she was six years old and she was pulling her wagon full of soda and donuts because that was the food that she was gonna take with her while she was running away from home. So there's a particular kind of EFT work that I do where it's a kind of soul retrieval work, if that makes any sense. So basically, I had her, as her adult self, go back to that six-year-old and comfort her and say, to, and say to the six-year-old, and actually in her mind's eye, visualizing, tapping on that little younger self and saying to her, you know what? This isn't your fault. Mom and dad are not well and it's okay you can let go of the soda and the donuts. And it was a really, really moving experience for her. And you know, that transformational coaching, you know, there's that great moment when you're in awe and the client is in awe and you have this huge breakthrough and it's like, yeah, you know. So she wrote to me a week later and she said, Marcella, remember how I wasn't quite sure that I could let go of the Diet Pepsi? You know, I, I wasn't sure at the end of that. And she said, for the past week, I've been walking by it in the supermarket and I barely even notice it's there. I don't want it. I don't want it anymore. And, it, and it's not even a struggle. It just simply, so it, it's almost like, you know, the Diet Pepsi demon left her body after we were able to sort of heal and really help that little six-year-old release and forgive. Wow. Cool. So, you know, what you've been sharing um, I think really brings uh, the deep personal aspect of this particular challenge and this work to life. And maybe especially, you know, considering International Women's Day, right? like the, um, the social context, the... Um, the pressures and expectations and everything that can kind of, um, you know, maybe uh, cause or certainly be a part of the, the cause of a lot of the, the trouble and unease that we're talking about. What are, maybe pointing at the other direction, what are the implications uh, for society of women mm -hmm. being able to transcend um, oh these challenges? What a great question. Wow. My God, it has so many implications. Yeah, it is. I know it's interesting that this is International Women's Day, isn't it? And yeah, that's such a big question. And it's one that I've been really, really like mulling over in my heart. Like, you know, what does this work have to do with the bigger picture of what's going on? So, you know, I'll tell you something, Travis, like this morning I was, you know, practicing and I was saying the Shambhala chants. And, you know, what I really got, something came to me this morning about, you know, in the Shambhala teachings, we talk so much about leadership. You know, the Sakyong talks so much about ruling your world. And, you know, we talk about being the sovereign of your home, let's say, or your life, right? You're sitting in, in the seat of rulership. 
And, you know, this morning when I was doing the Shambhala chants, I really felt, I felt like I was really um, calling in a very <laughs> emotional and kind of impassioned way to the ancestral sovereigns, you know, to the leaders of the past. And, you know, we, we draw from their example. But, you know, we are, you and I, and all of the other, everyone who's watching this, we are the leaders of the new golden age. And we are at such a time of, sh you know, change. I think it's pretty clear to just about all of us that the time for feminine leadership is, you know, coming due. And to me, the essence of that leadership, the essence is self-care because we have to start taking care of you know ourselves and the planet and you know the Sakyong talks about this so much about valuing ourselves cherishing ourselves right this is part of connecting to our basic goodness so for us as women on this planet um, we might not rule a country per se, but how we show up in the world is really paramount. And, you know, I mean, I've been part of these teachings for about 30 years, and it's like, oh, right. Like, you know, the whole idea of personal dignity that we talk about in the Shambhala teachings, you know, what is that? What is the essence of that? I mean, for me these days in the work that I do with women, and, and on my own journey, the more I can clear the obstacles that I have within myself to the experience of my basic goodness, the more my dignity can come forward, the more available I am not only to myself and my intimate world, but to society altogether. I, I feel like I'm kind of talking like a whole little labyrinth around this. I, I don't know if this is making any sense. I, I hope I'm painting a picture of something that, that makes sense. I feel it very deeply. I don't know if I can say it as deeply as I feel it, but. Uh, well, it's, it's coming through for me. I and mean, it's always that the, um, and this, you know, my experience that the personal um, journey is connected to the journey of society or how I relate with my own challenges is going to affect how um, present and available and inspired I am in my relationships, family, workplace, etc. And it, um, it seems like you are uh, experienced in and able to offer ways of engaging you know, one very particular realm of challenge that um, seems that a lot of people and maybe women in particular, um, you know, have to engage on some level. So maybe I've just talked the circle around a little bit more, but um, all that to say, uh, yes, I hear you. Yes. Well, I think we feel it. I and, mean, you know, you know, it's interesting about food in particular because there's nothing more intimate than our relationship with food. You know, what, did it, what we eat, what we take in becomes us. It becomes your muscle tissue, your cell tissue, your nerve tissue, you know. Um, there's a whole lot of research now, Travis, maybe you've heard about this, about the gut as the second brain. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you think about what you're putting into your gut and how that informs your consciousness, right? It doesn't get any more personal than this. <clears throat> And I think that's another place where it um, connects to the society, the greater society. You know, Michael Pollan has this saying, vote with your fork. Hmm. So in other words, you know, the food choices that we make have an impact. So, you know, and a lot of my clients are women who know what they need to be eating, but they can't get themselves to do it. So to be able, so for me to be able to bring women, people, to that place where they can really begin to abandon the food of the setting sun world, the, in, the food of the industrial food system. 
that is by its nature addictive, that is, you know, wants us to be addicted, you know, we begin to step out of that, that is extremely radical. You know, that's a place where personal choice has tremendous social impact. I'm getting excited yeah. talking yeah. about it. <laughs> well, this is, a, you know, it's, you know, really getting to a, a um, I don't know, it's a, it's a really powerful uh, topic or a powerful thing to work with. And maybe, um, maybe this is a good point to, uh, to leave it or to switch gears a little bit to um, the particular retreat at mm -hmm. SMC. Um, yeah, I feel such a sense of like what the journey may entail and what the implications for that are and the, you know, the broad, the most intimate and broadest sort of um, spiritual and societal levels. Um, and uh, in six weeks or so, you're coming up to SMC to lead, uh, let's see, it's April 19th to the 23rd. So it's not just a weekend, but it's a good, um, you know, good length retreat. And a lot of work can happen in a uh, four day retreat. I can tell you that. So um, anything in particular you'd like to say about this retreat to those who you know may be considering joining you? Well, I would say, <clears throat> you know, my inspiration to create this retreat came out of, you know, my own forgiveness work and, you know, also my work with clients. And, you know, it's, um, this is a great retreat for women who struggle with their food, who know that their struggles with their food are not just about food who know that they have people, places, circumstances, primarily themselves actually, that they need to forgive, but the forgiveness muscle is kind of in spasm. You know, it's, you know, forgiveness isn't a very popular topic in society these days. I mean, it is among us as Shambhala people, but you know, we, we're in a world right now that is drunk and mad on victim, victimization, victim mentality, right? So my intention with this retreat is to really create a container where women can come in and begin to unpack those issues that they know they are ready to let go of. So I'll be teaching EFT which the thing about EFT is that it's great, is that, you know, it's a great self-help tool. So, you know, you can do it yourself as well as work with, you know, me as a practitioner <clears throat> or other practitioners. So we will literally be unpacking. Um, and then I will also be teaching, in addition to EFT, other tools that women can use to kind of expedite the forgiveness process. And another piece of what I really want to create in this retreat is that sense of um, being witnessed because a big piece of forgiveness, of being able to forgive, is to have somebody who witnesses you and who just simply holds space for your, your story and can say, you know, that was hard. And then help you let that go. So, you know, my sense is like we're going to go down. And then the final piece of transformation is actually being able to step into that new identity in your world, to be someone who actually has gone through that kind of transformation and to allow yourself to be witnessed. Because that's, that's a hard thing for women, like women with forgiveness, you know, they start to lose weight and they go to their office place and people go, wow, you look great. And then they go, ah. <laughs> I can't handle it, right? And then the pounds come back on. So to be able to have the inner strength to hold the space of your transformation and to carry that out into the world, um, that's what I am hoping to create in this retreat. I'm Beautiful. getting so excited talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for, uh, you know, for your time and wisdom conversation today. 
And Thank you, Travis. I hope that um, uh, a lot of our listeners are finding this helpful, listeners and viewers. And just again to extend the invitation, if mm-hmm. uh, if any of you are feeling similarly excited for this retreat, like uh, like Marcella is, it is April nineteenth to the twenty third. April 19th to the 23rd, 2017 at Shamala Mountain Center, which, by the way, is uh, a beautiful 600-plus acre mountain valley retreat center in the Colorado Rockies. And uh, the retreat is called Women, Food, and Forgiveness, The Heroine's Journey. And we warmly, warmly invite you to uh, come up and join mm-hmm. the retreat. Yeah, thank you. And I would also just like to say to everybody listening that if there are women out there who are interested in this retreat, um, yeah, please register, absolutely. And if you have questions, I am available through Facebook, Tapping with Marcella, T-A-P-P-I-N-G with M-A-R-C-E-L-L-A. You know, you can contact me through Facebook. You can contact me through my website, tappingwithmarcella.com. Feel free to reach out with any questions you might have. I'd be happy to answer them. And I hope I see you and meet you and help you and get to travel the journey with you. Mm, that's great. Yeah, and there will be um, links to Marcella's Facebook and website just below where this video is hosted on the SMC blog. And you can uh, also, I should have mentioned this earlier, Marcella's been offering a wonderful series of written blog posts uh, that are also linked to below this video that um, yeah, I encourage you to check out and lots of other sorts of blog posts on the SMC blog. And you can go to shamalamountain.org to uh, look at all of our upcoming program offerings and so forth. So thank you to everyone who's tuned in, listening or watching this. And we hope to see you at Shamala Mountain Center soon, perhaps for this retreat with Marcella. Okay, thanks again, Marcella. Thank you, Travis. Thanks so much. This was really fun. (laughs) It was great. Good, good. Okay, well, uh, happy International Women's Day. Happy day in general. Good wishes to all of you, and see you soon.